All right. So we're starting with the X-Men. So in the X-Men, the premise is that uh, a number of people among the re regular, you know, human beings have these mutant powers that, that they're, they're able to do things that are outside the realm of regular human capacity. And some of them have been misunderstood for them. Some of them have been hurt for them. Uh, the, there's a man who ends up being called Professor X, who, uh, Xavier, he creates a safe place for them to come, the institute where they can come and learn to hone their powers for good. So a young woman arrives at the Xavier Institute, also known as the X Mansion, and this is where Professor X rolls around, you know, in his wheelchair and teaching, and, and there's people in different classrooms, and he, uh, and he, he's, He's kind of like the chaplain of the whole, the whole group. And she's brought to see Professor X. Welcome, he says. What's your superpower? The young woman replies, I know instinctively how many poles it will take to turn off a ceiling fan. She points up, up to the one above them, and she says, three poles. Professor X stands up and pulls three times, and just as she said on the third pull, the fan stops. Professor X says, you know, young lady, that's interesting, but not really a superpower. Yeah, she laughs. I was just kidding. I can heal paraplegics. And he looks down. He's standing up. He's like, oh, my God. He was paraplegic, but not anymore. Power. Today we're talking about power. Thine is the power. We pray whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So what is God's power? The Hebrew term used for power most of the time is geburach, which means force. It implies victory. It's strength. You know, God is mighty. That's the power that is usually talked about in the Hebrew scripture. In the New Testament, which it, we have in the Greek, the word is dunamis, which is the same root as the English word dynamite. It's explosive power. It breaks the boundaries. It's miracle working power, this dunamis that we hear about in the New Testament. It's capable of bringing something that seems impossible to bear. So where does this power of God happen? We know God is, is strong. God is dynamic. God is victorious. God is capable of miracles. But where does this power come about? Power is a tricky concept. Power has been misused. How many of you have seen the misuse of power? Most everyone has heard the quote, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. It's part of an insightful Quote by John Emmerich Edward Dalbert Acton, usually known as Lord Acton, Baron Acton. In 1870, he was one of a number of barons, of Catholics, who opposed the move to promulgate the doctrine of papal infallibility. He went to the First Vatican Council. He traveled to Rome to lobby against it, ultimately unsuccessfully. And he, can, he didn't, some people who were against it just left the church when that happened. He didn't. He continued attending Mass for the rest of his life. He received the last rites on his deathbed. The Catholic Church did not try to force his hand. They didn't 
force him to declare his allegiance to that rule that they had voted to accept the doctrine of papal infallibility. And it was in that context that he wrote a letter to the scholar and ecclesiastic Mandel Crichton, and this letter was dated 1887, and he made his most famous pronouncement. He said in context, he said, I cannot accept your canon that we are to judge pope and king unlike other men with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, it is the other way, he said, against the holders of power, increasing as power increases. Power tends to corrupt, he said, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is the point, he said, at which the negation of Catholicism and the negation of liberalism meet and keep high festival, and the end learns to justify the means. This point at which both think they are right and their leaders are right, whether it's pope or king, their leader is somehow infallible, above fault, and able, able of exercising all power without censure or accountability. Some modern scholars have identi identified or delineated different ways of talking about power. We have power over and power with. Power over being the power to dominate because of your role, your authority, your power. Power over is the power that a parent has over a child. Even if a parent is abusive and hurtful, a child can't escape. They can't just go, well, I'm four years old. I'm going off on my own. They're stuck. Power is the, that power over is the power a dictator has over the country. That whenever they want to shut something down, it shuts down. There's no freedom of the press. There's no freedom of assembly. That is power over. And then there's power with. Power with is power that works with people to strengthen their power by empowering them, by influencing them, by helping one another to grow in our capacity to get things done. This is what power means. Power is the capacity to do things, to accomplish something. Whether you have the financial power, whether you have the physical power, whether you have the intellectual power, whether you have the relational power, Whatever kind of power you have, it's the power to get things done, to do something, to accomplish something. And power with works with people, works with one another, working together to increase our capacity to accomplish something. The Apostle Paul Praise that we would know the exceeding, abundant, unsurpassed greatness of God's power. And I love the words here in the Greek. I'm going to share them with you for a minute because they're so cool. One of them is this word greatness, and it's literally megathos. Megathos, greatness. This is the word that Paul uses right here in the Greek. God's megathos, the, the megathos of God's power, just the greatness of his power. And then the word hyperbalo, which is the word that means actually literally balo is to throw and hyper is over. So this word in the Greek, hyperbalo means to throw over. It means it's just over our heads. So literally Paul is saying the the, the greatness that is over our heads. It's just like whoosh, you know. <laughs> That's how great God's power is. It's this hyperbalo megathos of God's power. It's, it's over and above our 
capacity to even imagine or conceive of. And Paul prays that we would know that power. Now, we, we include that, that word in our prayer, thine is the power. We say that whenever we say the Lord's Prayer, though some of you, if you've looked in your scriptures, you might notice that some versions of the scriptures don't include that in Matthew 6.13. It doesn't say thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory in a number of our translations, especially the more recent translations that are based on a carbon dating of the documents, it appears that that was not written into the earliest documents. And there's different reasons for that. It may have been that it was assumed. It was presumed. This is the way that you end a prayer, so Jesus doesn't need to say that. He doesn't say amen at the end of the prayer either. So it's just, you know, we heard that in the book of Chronicles where this is just, this is part of the way you end a prayer. You come back to God, yours is the greatness. Yours is the victory, the power, the glory. Everything belongs to you. So it may not have been included in the earliest manuscripts because it was assumed. I think that's probably the best way to think about it because some of the oldest texts, including the Aramaic Peshitta, which is a version of the scripture in the Aramaic from the second century, does include it. The fourth century, Father John Chrysostom cites the passage when he says, we bring to our remembrance the king under whom we are arrayed and signifies him to be more powerful than all. For thine, saith he, is the kingdom and the power and the glory. So he is quoting Jesus as saying that. So this very likely was passed down through the years. We also see it in one of the earliest catechisms, which is the the writings for teaching the early disciples from about the the year 100, We see it in there, in this thing called the teaching of the apostles, the Didache, it is in there. So even though it is not in some of the newer translations, there's a reason that we say it, that we have it as part of the Lord's Prayer. Thine is the power, this megathos, hyperbalo megathos, this great power of God that is so great that it's over our heads. Paul talks about it in his letter to the Ephesians that we heard read so beautifully today. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be flooded with light so that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, and the surpassingly great, surpassing greatness of his power. So first of all, Paul starts with this. He wants us to feel and recognize and lean into and understand and see God's power, but he starts with hope. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, and just take a minute and imagine that, like your heart has eyes. We have eyes in our body, but we have spiritual eyes, and they're in our heart. And sometimes you can see with your heart, you can see if somebody's suffering and needs help. You can see if somebody's up to no good, and you're like, I'm going to just stay away from that person today, or maybe I need to stop them. You can see with your heart. And Paul prays that our heart's vision will be full of light so that we know the hope of his calling. When we look around at the world 
And if we're praying, thine is the power, we can look around and say, wait a second, there are lots of things where God's power is not taking effect, (laughs) where God's power is not prevailing. Peace is one of them, right? Peace. The angels came and said, peace on earth and goodwill to all people. Where is that peace? We can look around perhaps in our own communities and say, we see people fighting. We, perhaps in our own families and say, we see people divided, alienated, unable to find common ground because they don't agree on politics or what we should do about our health or whatever the challenges are, just fighting. Where's God's power? And sometimes these are people of faith. And God is a reconciler and has called us to be reconciled, but there's no reconciliation. There's just fighting and denominationalism and backbiting and undermining each other and infighting. Where is God's power? I believe that what we're seeing now is not a surprise to God, and it's not the first time it's been going on. In fact, it's been going on since the earliest times. And that's why Paul starts with this prayer for us to have hope. Because sometimes just looking at a situation where we might have prayed, God, please move in this situation. Please bring healing. Please bring deliverance. Please stop the harm. Please help those who've been hurt. And nope, it just keeps on going on. That person just keeps on doing their harmful behavior and more and more people keep getting hurt and families are fractured and countries are broken down and institutions which should have a purpose are derailed. And we can lose hope. So this is the first thing. If you're in that place where there's something where you want God's power to move, where you need God's miraculous power to act, something that you cannot do yourself, you're like, I can't do world peace by myself, but you can, God. And I need hope that that is even possible. I can't do healing for this family. This person won't even listen to me. That person definitely is not doing what I think they should, and they're just fighting and at each other's throats. I can't. I can't do this, God, but you can, but give me hope that it's even possible. So that may be the first place to start, and that's where Paul starts. When he wants us to understand God's power, he tells us to start with hope. He prays for us to have hope in God's calling. If you've lost hope in God's power to change your circumstances, Pray with Paul that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so you know there is hope. This happened so beautifully in the story of Elisha when he was under attack and the king who was against him sent out an army and his servant was like, oh my Lord God, what are we going to do? This king sent a huge army and Elisha was like, don't worry. And he asked God to open his servant's eyes And suddenly her servant saw all the hills around this puny little army were full of angel armies. God has powers greater than whatever your circumstance is. So you might be looking at that little army and going, wow, I can't do it. You're looking at that family situation like, ah, this is is never going to happen. You're looking at the world. You're like, what? God has angel armies. God has powers greater than whatever you even think is possible. Even when you can't see it, God is working. Even when I can't feel it, God is working. He never stops, never stops working on our behalf. It is not hopeless. As Bishop Desmond Tutu said, as Christians, we are prisoners of hope. So that's where we start. If you've lost hope, Pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you know the hope of God's calling. And then Paul goes on as he's leading into this incredible 
scripture about the power of God. He prays first for us to have hope. Then he prays for us to know the riches of God's inheritance in the saints. If we're going to do something that is risky and difficult and scary, we need to know that it's worth it. That there are rewards. If God is leading you to lean into his power and speak the truth in a difficult conversation, Paul is saying there is a glorious inheritance for you. There is a glorious inheritance for you there is freedom and joy for you if god is leading you to look at your own shortcomings and to take account for them and to make apologies for them and to make restitution for them then paul wants you to know that there is a glorious inheritance when you do that there is freedom and joy that you didn't even know was possible when you step up, when you take a risk, when you stand in God's power, there is a glorious inheritance for you. If God is calling you to follow him into a new and deeper relationship, perhaps one that might seem scary, perhaps power of God moving in you in a new way that might even feel like you're going to be misunderstood or made fun of paul wants you to know that there is a glorious inheritance of joy and healing and freedom and peace that is available to you the riches so pray that you would know the riches of god's inheritance that are available for the saints and then when we have hope that something is possible, when we know that God wants to bless us far beyond we could ask or imagine, then Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would know the surpassing greatness of his power. And then there's this word, ace which is sometimes translated in us who believe. Sometimes it's translated toward us who believe. Sometimes it's translated with us to believe, who believe. But I think what it's talking about is that power with. Paul is talking about here, this word ace, it means into, it means toward, but it's not just, it, it means to, it's not just, it's to us, but it's, it's two in a way that penetrates, that permeates, that infuses and fills. So this is what Paul is talking about. That God's power infuses and fills and transforms and heals and breaks you free. That it's his, this is what he wants us to see. The surpassing greatness of his power into us through us, with us, toward us. God's power moving in us. This is the way that God's power works. Some people may try to accomplish God's ends through political power. This is not God's way. Not by having a dictator who says we're only doing what God wants. That's, that is certain schools of Islam, that's their way. You have law that says you're only doing what we think God wants. That is Islam. That is not Christianity. In Christianity, the way that God's power works is through changed hearts and minds. And as hearts and minds and then the actions that flow forth from them are changed then we change the systems because we work together in power with to build systems that can care for our earth to build systems that can care for the least of these that care for our young people and our children that make sure that mothers have food that babies have care that children have education 
we do that not because it's forced from the top down, but because it springs up as God's power moves in us. As God's kingdom comes through us. as God's glory is revealed by the work of our hands, shaped and directed by God. This is God's power at work. And I want to close with just this one concept, which I love. Actually, two concepts that came, they're connected uh, in our Bible study. On Tuesdays, we have Bible study um, where we always look at the upcoming scripture and I love it. There's always just so much richness in our conversation. We meet out in the courtyard. If you're local, please do come. You can join us at noontime. You can bring your lunch or bring food to share. We sit outside and we pray and we delve into the scripture that is coming for the coming Sunday. And this past Tuesday, one of the, one of the folks said, we are a people that don't, just believe in miracles, we depend on them. We don't just believe in miracles, we depend on them. I hope that there is something that you are depending on the miraculous power of God for in your life. If there's not, you need to pray for what that is because God wants to do something miraculous through you, something that seems impossible. Perhaps it's healing in your family. Perhaps it's healing in our body politic. Perhaps it's transformation in yourself. Whatever it is, there should be something miraculous that God has Spoken into your hearts that will require that power greater than yourself so that you can lean into God's power, so that you can pray for God to give you hope that it can change, so that you can trust God for the riches that are coming when you say yes and when he moves. And so that you can come to know, not just with confidence, but with something that might have been coined by our wonderful minister Evelyn on Tuesday, Godfidence. None of us had ever heard that before, but Godfidence, that is what we're talking about, Godfidence. Fide is faith, not just confidence in your own self, like I can do this and that's good, but Godfidence, that God can do something over your head great through his power working into you. May it be so.